So I'll just introduce you to everybody, um, give out a few announcements, and then once you're ready, just go ahead and, and give your presentation. Okay. All right, we'll go again and get started here, everybody. Uh, welcome, thanks for coming in today. A um, few announcements before we get started. We'll drop the link to our email list down in the dis uh, description box and in the chat. So make sure to sign up for that if you haven't already. You can stay up for date for all of our future um, presentations. And then I'd like to present today's uh, presenting physician, Dr. Ogunkwa. Dr. Ogunkwa got his MD from the University of Pennsylvania. He is currently an anesthesiologist, and he's going to specialize in obstetric um, anesthesiology. So it's my pleasure to introduce him. And Dr. Gunkwa, you can go ahead and, and take the floor. I think you're muted again. <laughs> Unmute. All right, we already had that snap. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Oluswari Gunkwa. I am an uh, anesthesiologist which I think is his best specialty out there. So I'm happy to tell you guys about it today. Um, I work at University of Texas Southwestern, which is also where I trained, where I did my residency and my fellowship. Um, currently, I am the Associate Division Director for OB Anesthesia for UC Southwestern. I'm also the Associate Clinical Director for uh, anesthesia, Obstetric Anesthesia Operations at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. So I'm gonna take myself off video. I'm gonna uh, tell you guys a little bit of a peek back in the time. It was actually fun to do this. I was able to go back and see all of, uh, all of these old pictures, some of which I've put on some of these slides. All right, so like most of you, I don't know, I wanted to be a doctor for as long as I can remember. Um, I was born to two physician parents, a surgeon and obstetrician, so it's kind of in, it's kind of in my blood. So it's a very long journey, but at the end of it, it's very well worth it. There will be peaks in that journey. There will be some valleys. Just got to persevere and get to the end of it, but it's worth it. It's worth it at the end. So my first form of medicine. So I like, I haven't seen these pictures in so long. So when I was putting this, this together, this was me, I think in like seventh or eighth grade, somewhere after my seventh or eighth grade year. I was in a summer program at a Temple University Hospital um, called the Physician Sciences Training Program. And basically it was for kids who thought they wanted to be doctors one day. But since you can't exactly take care of patients when you're a seventh grader, uh, you spend a lot of time working in labs. So I think this is me either after 11th or 12th grade. So this is my one of my research mentors uh, during one of my summer, 12 week summer uh, research internships. And this was at Merck in uh, San Diego. So I got to travel from all over the country, spending summers on uh, doing research. Um, this is either in San Diego. I think it's also, I think, oh, I think that was also, this is also in San Diego on the left, the left picture there. So the premises is you would work all summer developing a, a, a clinical question at the end you present it. This was a poster board presentation, but we should we should get PowerPoint presentations of our kind of our summer experience. So this was my first kind of introduction to what medicine could be from a, a research perspective. And also during those summers, I would spend uh, kind of maybe like four hours, four hours uh, during the week shadowing a physician. So this was kind of what planted the seed besides my parents. Maryland. So I so this was Denton. I, 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 it looks like a blurry picture. I've typed in Denton Hall 2004, hoping I could see when I arrived. I remember I was the last person to arrive in my triplet. So I was in a triple. Uh, and then we had someone connected in a single next door. So there were four of us kind of in this little suite. And I remember going up to the seventh floor. That was my floor. And I remember just sweating. There was no air conditioning. We had like Literally, we bought like six or seven fans and we were just blowing hot air everywhere. We would leave our door open overnight trying to have some crosswind. It didn't work. 
I just remember being hot, but I, that was my introduction to Maryland. Um, I was in the Honors College and I was one of the uh, Banner Key Key Scholarship recipients when I was at uh, Maryland. So this, the best thing that happened to me at Maryland is the lady on the left picture, the lady in the blue dress, my, my girlfriend at that point, which turned out to be my wife. So this was, I met her at Maryland. Uh, she did uh, two years at College Park and went two years uh, in Baltimore for her nursing degree. So this was, this was graduation for me on the left, uh, graduation for her from uh, University of Maryland uh, on the right. And then some of my family, my, my parents, my uncle, my sister also in that left picture. So med school, where everybody's headed. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, things people say about getting into med school. By the end of the day, it's they want a well-rounded person. They want a normal human being, but they also want you to do well on these tests and get good grades. I, there's, I mean, there's a lot more to your application than that, but if those two things are solid, your GPA and your MCAT, you're probably very well set on your way. Um, I kind of, I framed my medical school curriculum through what we did at Penn. So at Penn, we actually didn't do the traditional two year pre clerkship curriculum. We did a 18 month curriculum where you spent your first 18 months taking just anatomy, histology, epidemiology, just kind of all the basic classes. And then halfway through what you traditionally be in your second year of medical school, we started our clerkships. So that's your mandatory clerkships or medicine, both internal and family, surgery slash anesthesia, um, OB, PEDS, EM, neuro and psych. Uh, what I liked about my med school experience was that because we did clerkships so early, you had a longer time period to do electives. So I think anesthesia, I got lucky because I did anesthesia, I think for like a week or something during my surgery clerk, surgery clerkship. But then I went back and did like two more months of it early on in the year as a, uh, at that point would have been halfway through my third year of med school. I was able to do two more months. I was like, okay, so this is, what I, this is, this is for me. So uh, med school, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this is graduation again, me being uh, donned on the right, my dad taking a picture. Uh, more, I, I always try, I'm trying to show you guys this journey is not gonna be one you make on your own. You're gonna need a lot of support. That's why I'm showing you all my family in here. Uh, my, once again, my girlfriend still at that time, we got married two weeks after the picture on the left. Uh, so uh, this was Penn graduation. And when I, when I was at uh, Penn, she was actually a nurse at Penn. And then she got her master's in nursing from Temple, where I started my, that very, very first picture. And then this is my mom, my dad on the right, and my little brother, little brother, because you can see how much bigger he is than me. So I make sure to emphasize little brother. Uh, he's way taller than me by my four inches. Um, once again, this is just stuff, more stuff for graduation. The picture on the right, I'm, I included this on purpose. So remember that little seventh grade kid you saw standing there in his purple uh, thing in his khakis? This was the founder of that program that I was in. And this is a Dr. Moses Williams. So he actually came to celebrate with me when I graduated from Metzl. So he kind of, he seen me at kind of uh, all stages. And it was kind of pretty awesome because there are a lot of kids like me who were interested in medicine, but this, opportunity to give a lot of us an avenue to kind of explore it and made our applications. For example, when I, when, I, when I applied for undergrad, I'd already had months, summers of research, it was really helped for, for me to get that scholarship. So I include him just to say thanks to him. And once again, the story is the same, that journey you're gonna be on, it's not, you are the one basically doing a lot of the work with a lot of people who are gonna support you through this process. So don't forget to acknowledge, acknowledge them. Mash day. So mash day. This is a, it's a happy day and a sad day. It was a happy day for me. Some other people were crying so they didn't get what they wanted. Uh, when I went around the country, I wanted, to, I was looking for a residency program where I thought I would fit in, where I thought I would have opportunities to kind of grow, and where they, where they had high patient volume. And UT Southwestern, where I currently practice as an anesthesiologist, it was where I wanted was my number one choice for. Uh, residency and this is me opening up my envelope with with happiness in the eyes and other some people were crying that day not tears of joy but i was extremely happy uh with my mash and i've been extremely happy choosing a southwestern for my um anesthesia training and now on this faculty so why did i choose anesthesiology 
Uh, what I quickly discovered, some people come into medical school with an idea of what they want to do. Um, they, 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 their dad owns a family practice, so they want to go back. They want to become a family medicine doc and go back. Or, hey, my mom is an obstetrician or my mom is an orthopod and I want to be an orthopod. Although I had parents in the medical field, I was open to basically doing anything as far as um, choice of what I wanted to practice. So for me, it was a process of elimination. Um, I wanted, but what I found out was I wanted to do something that was procedural and anesthesia is extremely procedural. We're doing A lines here on the left, we're doing central lines, we're placing regional blocks, replacing regional catheters, replacing epidurals. Basically every time we see a patient, we're doing something to them. I also discovered a few things about myself during my med school's clerkships. One, I hated rounding. Hate, I know hate's a strong word, but I hated rounding and I could not stay in clinic. So this gave me an opportunity not to do either and still be able to take good care of patients. And also well, something I like about anesthesia, when you finish your anesthesia training, you still interact with a lot of specialties. It's not just, um, you're, not, you're not just stuck interacting only with, I don't know, sitting in the clinic all day, just your patients. Like we interact with surgeons from all different orth orthopedics, or obstetrician, general surgeons, we interact with neurosurgeons. We basically get to do medicine in many different fields, even when we're completely done our practicing. So that's what drew me uh, to anesthesia. So in my anesthesiology training, it's a four-year residency. Um, you have your, your first year of anesthesia residency is not, you don't actually do anesthesia. You, you either do either a, sur a surgery internship, a medicine internship, or something called a tra transitional year, which is what, what this is. So at UT Southwestern, um, you can either come in as a CA1, meaning your second year of anesthesia after you did your intern year somewhere else, and this is for any anesthesia program, or you can come in at what's called a categorical resident where you do all four years at the same place. So intern year, I spent five months doing internal medicine. Once again, it's a little thought that I did not like medicine. Um, I did a two to three months of ICU, including taking care of liver transplant patients, uh, surgical ICU patients, cardiac ICU patients, um, I did uh, a month of emergency medicine, a month of pulmonology, a uh, peds, palm month, neurology, and then another, and more ICU. CA one year is, where, is when you finally start doing anesthesia. It's basically a basic year where you kind of do a bunch of bread and butter cases. Um, I did general ORs, more ICU, um, obstetrics. That's when I did two months of obstetrics. And I, and I saw that I, I liked OB as a medical student. So this kind of, I really liked it when I did it as a uh, CA1. Um, CA2 year, you do more advanced um, rotations, um, cardiac, you, you finally, we finally did pediatrics as a CA2, more ICU, um, you do regionals, which is just uh, blocks for uh, surgery, uh, take care of patients in the post-op care unit and neuro, neurosurgery. And then CA3 year is more just more advanced cardiac transplant than ICU and then more electives. So um, their post anesthesia residency, you can be done after four years of residency and go out and practice in private practice. Um, if you want to do subspecialty training, for example, if you want to take care of kids, you're probably going to require in this day and age a pediatric anesthesia fellowship. If you want to take care of heart patients, you're probably going to have to do a, a cardiac anesthesia fellowship. Uh, so it's getting more and more subspecialized. But even if even as a general anesthesiologist depending on what part of the country you are in, you might have to do everything still. So this was me uh, during residency, uh, presenting at a conference here on the left and then on the right. Uh, this is Dr. Miller, who is like, who, one of like the godfathers of modern anesthesia who writes our major textbook. He came and gave grand rounds at our uh, institution. So I got a picture with him. So um, I chose to do an OB anesthesia fellowship. I really like taking care of pregnant moms. I like the, um, at our institution, so most places, right, they have maybe two to 3,000 deliveries in a year. We have over 12,000. So we, we do four to five times what everybody else is doing. So I really like the fast plate, the fast paced environment, the patient population, and the fact that we took care of a lot of sick uh, patients. So this is just a picture of two anesthesiologists placing an epidural but also allowed me to start um, doing more research. And then uh, 
just learning how to take care of not only high risk moms, but also high risk uh, new, newborn uh, neonates. So anesthesiology fellowships, there are a bunch. Some are ACGME accredited. Six of these are ACGME accredited and two of them are not. So the ones that are ACGME accredited are, um, are adult cardiothoracic, uh, chronic pain, critical care medicine, OB anesthesia, uh, pediatric cerebral anesthesia, and then neuroanesthesia pediatric and cardiothoracic, pediatric cardiothoracic are not ACGME accredited. But um, with all of these fellowships, another plus for anesthesia, after four years of residency, most of these fellowships are just one year long, one year long, right? Other specialties might be three years of internal medicine and after three years of CARDS. So after five years, we're basically done and we're board certified and we have, we're special, we can also get extra, uh, extra training during that period of time. Uh, PEDS cardiothoracic usually is now a two year thing because you have to first do the PEDS fellowship, then the pediatric cardiothoracic. So fellowship, things change during residency. We got a couple of critters join the family. So it, these are what, four, four year old pictures. So my kids are a lot bigger now than they are there. But this was me, this was our pictures for a uh, fellowship graduation. My wife, my kids, uh, Grant is my, my son, the older, and then Audrey is my daughter there. And this is some more of our uh, group, you see as you go through this process, life still happens. So we've had a few of us had some kids uh, during this process. So day to day, uh, what is it like? Well, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we do a lot of uh, interesting things. Uh, oh, this picture is of a um, of two anesthesiologists doing a fiber optic uh, intubation, uh, a nasal fiber optic intubation on the patient. So we got to play with toys and I, I like that as part of my uh, daily uh, job. Um, I'm gonna only talk about the day-to-day -day for academic practice because I have not done private practice. It's So the main difference is academic practice will have more research or admin responsibilities, private practice just straight taking care of patients in a, uh, in, in a, in a uh, hospital that doesn't really have trainees. Um, I stayed in academic medicine because I wanted to teach residents. I wanted to help uh, develop the next generation of anesthesiologists but I also still get to practice um, clinical medicine. Um, I still get to take, I still get to do research and I have some administrative responsibilities as part of being in a hospital system. Uh, the days are typically eight to 12 hour days, depending on the days. Um, we work 40 to 60 hours a week, uh, depending on, on what type of answers you're doing. We do have to work on weekends and we do and especially on OB, we have to cover overnight calls because babies come whenever they feel like. They don't. They don't. They don't wait for you to uh, to have it nicely scheduled. So the joke in anesthesia is uh, we basically just sit there and drink coffee all day and relax. Uh, that's true and not true. Uh, I I like to say when I started out medical school, I wanted to be a surgeon. My very first case was a thoracic case where they were peeling off the pleura and a guy with her what the disease process was. I stood in the same spot for 14 hours straight. I saw the anesthesiologist go to the bathroom, go to lunch, uh, take breaks. And I was like, why am I on this side of the drink? They're over there looking happier and much more relaxed. And I remember when I, when I finally asked to break scrub after 14 hours, to uh, go to the bathroom, my, the surgeon laughed. He's like, it's only been, like, it's not been that long. I was like, are you kidding me? I don't know how I stood there for 14 hours. I remember, I was like, and that's the first and last day I wanted to become a surgeon. And it ended, ended right there after that first case. So anesthesia can be defined as hours of boredom, minutes of thrill, and seconds of terror. I think this is one of the few specialties that your actions can kill someone. Right, a, a lot of other, if I'm taking care of a patient in the clinic, they're coming in, I don't know, they have high blood pressure, I give them medications. What I do is not gonna be gonna kill them immediately. And anesthesia, your actions can kill somebody. So we train not for the hours of boredom, we train for those seconds of terror. Because of some people you'll see when that terror hits, they don't react, they just stand there. Well, that's if you're not an anesthesiologist. <laughs> when, when things start going wrong, you have, to, you have to start doing things to try to help you know, improve your patient's uh, outcome. And this is just me with some of our lovely nurses uh, where I work. 
So I'm gonna present um, a OB case. And the thing about anesthesia is when we talk about cases, you can't just, it's, it's, you have to think about the other side of the drape. So in this case, we have a, a G2P1 female. So she's, uh, she's, this is her second pregnancy. She already has one baby alive in the home. She's a chronic hypertensive. She has a gestational diabetes and she's had a prior C-section, okay? She has no allergies. She presents to the hospital after a rupture of membranes at home and she wants to attempt vaginal delivery. So we call this a VBAC. So a virginal birth after cesarean or a TOLAC trial of labor after cesarean. Um, the risk with doing a VBAC is there's a risk the uterus could rupture while she tries to push the baby out. So it's between the mom and the OB to discuss the risk and benefits. Usually if you've had only one cesarean, they'll let you attempt to deliver vaginally. If you've had more than one, they will strongly try to talk you out of it because your risk of rupture goes up. So she presents with vital signs of 167 over 90. Um, heart rate's 80, respiratory rate's 12, pulse ox 90%. So what are our concerns? Well, the first thing, if I saw this lady in my own labor and delivery, I would first look at her medical history. She's hypertensive, that baseline. So the question I'd first ask myself is, is her hypertension now, is that due to chronic hypertension or could she have something called preeclampsia, which we'll talk about. So, the main things are, this is a VBAC, so we already talked about risk of uterine rupture. This, she's hypertensive, but she presents hypertensive to the hospital. So is this preeclampsia or chronic hypertension? So preeclampsia is a, characterized usually by high blood pressure and signs and symptoms of uh, end organ damage or possible end organ damage. And these moms, the things you would do right away are to send labs and to confirm um, that that blood pressure is real. So at 15 minutes later, we'll take another blood pressure to see if it's still elevated or is she just in pain that's causing her to be hypertensive at this time. And we also send labs. So we send labs on this model and labs came back with protein in her urine. Okay, she's, not, she's preeclamptic. Uh, she's thrombocytopenic, her plates are low at 88,000 and her creatinine is elevated. So in um, a normal mom, the, their creatinine is actually lower than, no, lower than it would be in a quote unquote normal non-pregnant mother. So creatinine at 1.4 is high for a um, pregnant uh, mom. So what you should do in this, in the, for these patients, we start them on magnesium infusions and that's to help with seizure prophylaxis because high blood pressures can lead patients to have, patients who are preeclamptic are at high risk of having eclampsia, which is basically they start seizing. Her platelets, for, from an anesthesia standpoint, the things we care about are one, that she started on magnesium infusion, and two, we worry about her platelet level. So in this case, her platelet level is around 90K. Most people will still place an epidural if your platelet level is of 70K. So she's, although she's, her platelets are low, she's still in, the, in an okay range for us to place an epidural. So we go ahead and we place an epidural. So our epidurals are placed. 30 minutes later, you're called to the bedside. The patient is struggling to breathe. What do you do now? So this is anesthesia in a nutshell, right? You do something, you could be the cause of this problem or something that the obese done that could cause her this problem. So. In this case, the things that would be high on my list to worry about is with an epidural, there's a risk that we gave her too much medicine. She could have something called a high spinal, which basically means our medication level has risen high enough to take away her drive to breathe. So that's, I'd be concerned about that. But also the obese did something. They gave the patient magnesium, right? Because she was preeclamptic. Magnesium can also cause these symptoms. So the fun, so every single day I get to deal with, uh, Scenarios like this, which keeps the job interesting, because this could be us, this could be them. So how do we react to the situation? This is anesthesia in a nutshell. Things go, you do something, things go wrong, you fix it, or you do things to try to prevent uh, these things from happening. So uh, the kids here, I just want to show you, my kids have grown since you last saw them. This is two years ago when we went to Barcelona, Spain. So this was Park Cool on the right lovely trip. I miss travel since COVID has hit. And now in the days of the pandemic, travel is harder. This is Phoenix on the left, and this is uh, Big Bend National Park 
on the right. So as a family, we 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 love to uh, we love to travel, and I can't wait for the pandemic to come to a grinding end because there's a lot of places we still want to see. We actually have a my son here is uh, in this picture on the left. He's seven here. Uh, our goal is to hit all fifty states and fifty countries before he goes to um, college. So we have eleven more years to. They have, I think, twenty seven states left because last year got completely torpedoed. And then they have. Uh, how many countries that we have more 40 something countries left. So we have to get a move on if we're going to hit our, hit our travel goals. So the advice I would give to my younger self um, is to enjoy the process, especially when it gets hard for a lot of you. And I'll speak about myself. Uh, college, although it was challenging, was kind of what it wasn't. Uh, it was not what medical school was. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So it, it, every, every, I mean, remember high school, think about your college self now, looking back at high school, you're like, how did I ever think that was hard? Your, your med school self, look back at your college self and be like, God, you were, you were having a vacation. Your, 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 your residence self, look back at your med school self and say, at least you didn't have to work and still try to study. And each step you look back and you're like, oh, it wasn't as horrible as I thought it was. While you're going through it though, it feels like you're going through a, a really tough process. So just remember, you sign up for this, and there are a lot of people who would give, who would cut off to get the opportunity you're currently getting. So enjoy, enjoy even even when it gets difficult. And balance is important. Um, you are so a lot of um, us spend a lot of time kind of chasing this goal of becoming physicians, and you will spend a lot of your life in a library studying or in a hospital taking patients. Remember that there is more life than that. So when the opportunities are to take trips or to relax, take full advantage of them because you're going to be working hard when you're at work. So balance is important, but it's almost impossible because right now if you're studying for the MCAT, you have zero balance. You're only, you're only focused right now on studying for the MCAT. Well, that's going to end at some point. You're going to take the test. You're going to do fine on it. And when, when that's when you go past that program before med school starts, enjoy, enjoy yourself, relax because each step, it's going to be hard. So that concludes the presentation, and now I can we can talk. Well, that was thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I thought I, I love the story of you and your wife meeting in undergrad, and then kind of developing this family with a crazy traveling passion. <laughs> yeah, we do love to travel. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's it's funny you uh you go to co you go to college to learn but then you get a much better uh I got yeah that was like the best thing happened to me was at Maryland with my wife so yeah now I since we, we all go to Maryland a lot of our audience is also our fellow terrapins um can you talk to us about like your pre med experience at Maryland I know you said like you look back at yourself when you were in med school and thought it was totally easy or anything like that. Um, but can you kind of talk to what your life looked like when you were in our shoes? So it was, um, I, so I started in Denton 7. I lived in Old Leonardtown for two years. And then I moved <laughs> off campus because they booted us because there, no, there was no housing left when I was a senior. And we got booted off campus. I had to go find somewhere else to, to live. So that's the living. But also while I was at Maryland. I was involved in a lot of clubs. I actually walked onto the track team for a year. And then I realized that, uh, balancing track and uh, going to med school when you're not taking up, when you're not a bio major, and you have to take extra classes that are outside. So 19 credits in track, we're not quite mixing. So we have to say bye-bye to that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think <laughs> I, I, I took advantage of there were a lot of things in Maryland. I met a lot of great people I'm still friends with today. I mean, and luckily I, we were talking before the, uh, before the video started that I was a psychology and a history double major. So I got to meet a lot of people from, non from a non-science background so i think it made my experience a little bit different than my group with my roommates were bio majors so it made my different my experience completely different i took all the class i had to take to go to, to go to medical school but i was able to also explore other things and see other people's worldviews i'm not necessarily so focused on medicine that's awesome and, and even though you started off in the sweaty denton hall it turned out all right <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I still remember the heat because I like I literally like to sleep at 68 degrees. So it was like 95. Yeah. It was it, I, I, I still remember my wife lived on my wife lived on the eighth floor of mm -hmm. Denton. So she was even hotter than I was probably. That's horrible. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Now, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, kind of your workflow as an anesthesiologist. You said there's those seconds of terror where you train, you train years in order to properly react in those, um, in those situations. Can you talk to us about um, what one of these situations during surgery would look like and how, how you would um, approach it in terms of keeping the patient safe? So let me actually, I'll, I'll give you a different scenario. All right, I'll tell you the day I, became, I wanted to become an anesthesiologist. I was actually on a med on a, an ICU rotation and we were rounding, right? And then we heard code blue, the patient was like three doors down. So I remember we walked into the room and it was just like absolute chaos. The, the medicine residents were, I don't know what they were doing. It was just, everybody was just in a tizzy. And in walks this guy with a scrub cap on his head. I know why, I know what makes it up, so I don't know who they were. Just calm, looking like he was at a Sunday picnic. He was like, anesthesia here for the airway. Goes to the top of the bed. I mean, it's just like panic. He just gives her the medicine. He just looked like he was just, he was just doing his job. And he, there wasn't, he was, he was like feeding into the surrounding. And he just, tube, you have an airway now. Let me know if you need me. It was like, like like foot it off. No, like I don't be you people want to be that guy. <laughs> so so that's so so that was like because when you do anesthesia residency, right? There's been a lot of times when nothing happens, right? You're just sitting there, you're you put your patient to sleep, you sit on your stool, you you know, get up, give them a little blood pressure medicine, increase your blood pressure or medicine to decrease your blood pressure. Uh, you make sure they're ventilating, okay. That's what most of your day is gonna be, right? But then you realize that wait a second, uh surgeon we don't have like because we like we see before they see it but do you guys feel a pulse over there i think I, they check your leads mm, no there's no pulse do you feel a pulse no i don't feel a pulse up here do you feel a pulse up there the funny part is when that happens right you would think that the surgeons would be all on it they usually just step back from the drape and keep sterile and you have to try to save the patient so that and in that moment right you don't have time to oh what should i do now Right, you have to do something. It might it might help, it might hurt, but you have to you have to take action. You have to you have to do something. So I do so. That didn't work. What can I do next? Like what what? I, then you start going through your head. Well, what do I think is going wrong? Okay, is it, are we ventilating patient? Okay, no, we're ventilating fine. Oh, well, we have our pressure is extremely soft. Hey guys, then you have to start communicating. Do you guys have do you guys have a lack in there? Is there a bleeding there? Usually they'll tell you no, we're fine. Well, we're not fine because the pressure is fifties. So can you please look again? And oh, there's that leader. So. Can we get blood? Then so now you're quarterbacking while they're trying to fix the bleeder. Can we, oh yeah, we need blood in the room. We need the room. Oh, we get, we need backup. So it's like, and that's your, doesn't, so I would say 90% of the time, 90% of the time, you're just sitting there, it's five to 10%. That's where most of your training happens. How do you react when things go wrong? Uh, that's great. I love the story of the anesthesiologist walking in on the code, just totally chill. Um, just, it I looked think like he was at a picnic. Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably one of the most important things when you're dealing in a stressful situation and not let it paralyze you and just do your job because you got to prioritize the patient in that case. So one of our, one of my attendings as a resident said, uh, he said, uh, when you go into the room, you are the thermostat, you set the temperature. If you go in and you panic, they're already going to panic, right? So if they see you panicking, the panic is going to be in full force. But if you go in the room and you, even if you're terrified inside, you go in and you just start doing your job. Most people look, okay, he like he's he's like he's just doing his job. But maybe I can try to help him. So he said, "You are the thermostat," and it's very true. Right, you have to kind of just center the energy of the room to keep everyone calm. Now, I have a question here about the the types of surgeries you work on. You mentioned your um, you work on pregnant mothers. Now, are you actually? present during the delivery or is it just if the mother happens to need surgery during her pregnancy so we for we run away before before the delivery and so if a woman's had a bad delivery right we just want to place the epidural make sure you're comfortable once that's achieved and if you're comfortable we are running out of the door we only part of that process <laughs> so that's why we have obstetricians for cesarean sections of course or um if we do a tubal or if we do other um, other procedures we're present now, most anesthesiologists don't just do OB, right? Then we also take care of general anesthesia patients or general surgery patients, gyne patients, orthopedic surgery patients, general surgery patients. So although you're an OB anesthesiologist, you're still neurosurgery, you're still supposed to be able to take care of any patient that shows up. 
The only patient I would say that would be kind of specialized is cardiac patients. Those are known. But if a cardiac patient crashes, if your OB patient becomes a, can become a cardiac patient, if their heart stops working, right, you still have to know what to do. Okay, so you 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 work on everything, and then you also do OB. Is, yeah, but is what it sounds but, like. Yeah, OB is for most OB anesthesiologists. OB is your is your main thing. Right. Maybe sixty percent of your time, but you still take care of patients. Gotcha. Down the, the, okay. the, the other types of surgery. So you still need to have a, a very wide depth of knowledge in a bunch of different fields. Yes, because if you are on trauma call, traumas can be anything. Right. It can be a gunshot. It can be somebody a four-wheeler and, and broke and broke half their body. So it can be anything. Right. I hate to interject. I'm just curious. Do you ever have to do any anesthesia with, you know, babies if you're so, in that setting? So good, good you asked. So what happens is at our institution, at least, right? Um, when, if a baby is born in distress, we have a great neonatology team who, who, who will come down to assist. If they cannot get the airway, they look right and say, airway expert, do you want to come give this a, give this a try on this tiny newborn, all right? We're lucky we have a great neonatology uh, group that helps us. Other places, if I'm a small hospital in middle of Texas, when that baby comes out, it's not breathing, guess who they're looking at? Anesthesia, what you mean? So you have to be fast following that. And that was part of our um, training as, during my health training was to take care of, was to do a nipple rotation, take care of newborn babies and also take care of babies acutely when they were decompensating after delivery. So it's part of your expectations that in that situation, as someone who, although you work primarily in an adult airway, it's still an airway, you should, you still, it's the same tools we use. So you, you should be able to at least place, place the breathing tube. And um, you mentioned that one of the reasons that was driving you to stay in academic medicine rather than shifting into private practice was the ability to teach and train this next generation of anesthesiologists. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the role that med students and residents play in, um, in your day-to-day -day life in terms of patient care? So uh, most days um, we take, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm taking care of a patient, what I mean is I'm supervising a resident taking care of a patient. Or I'm supervising a resident medical student taking care of a patient. So most of our days when we take care of patients, I'm teaching them at every step. Hey, we want to place an epidural for this patient. I don't know how to place an epidural. Okay, I'm going to show you. First, get some sterile gloves on. First, clean off their back. Oh, here's the drape. Put the drape here. Don't, don't get yourself contaminated. Okay, this is a two-week. Yes. We're going to put that in her back? Yes. This long, long, yes, it's going in her back. Okay. So it's it's, you will see the same resident on day one and see them a year later when they come back to our level residency, it's like a completely different person because they've had, they've had the experience, they've had the training in the interim. But we get, I remember myself on my very first day, put trying to fix my first epidural and just my hands were just, you don't know what you're doing, right? <laughs> but you, that's what you're there for to learn. So in that, is that, I feel like it's our job as, um, anesthesiologists who were trained by somebody else to help train the next group that's coming. And is this something you knew that you wanted to do when you were going through med school and residency? Did you see yourself as a teacher, as a mentor to future residents, or is this just kind of something that you felt stumbled into? So when I, I didn't um, know when I started residency, that I was going to go into academics. I thought I might go into private practice, but if you, if I look at my own personal history, um, I've always, even when I was a Maryland um, student, right? I was mentoring uh, middle school and high school students in the community through, I forget the name of the uh, mentoring program. So I've always taught in some capacity. I was tutoring, tutoring free tutoring for, for, for students also. So I've always taught in some capacity. This is a continuation of that. That's cool. So you have a long history of doing this. And you said you, you've been doing research, it looks like since you were in seventh grade, um, wearing that purple polo. Uh, and you said you have research as part of your career right now. What kind of, what kind of things are you looking into? Are you publishing anything actually? So we are actively trying to, trying to publish this. Easier said than done, but it's a, it's a process. So, so we are, um, my research um, looks at necessary sections. So not wait until they start bleeding, but to try to see what we can do in the interim before they start bleeding, to try to decrease the amount of blood that's lost. So that's something I'm currently working on, but there's also other things like uh, post-operative uh, post uh, pain management in these pregnant women 
So it's, I mean, our field and most fields of medicine have diverse avenues for you to uh, explore. And I'm just kind of dipped my toes in a few things for how I would spend the rest of my career studying. Okay. And how do you physically conduct this research? Do you recruit patients into trials or yes. is it more observational? So both. So I've done um, a large clinical trial recruiting patients um, on the labor floor um, for one of the studies. We also do observational studies. We do quality improvement studies. So it's uh, a bit of everything. Um, basically, uh, with any kind of research, um, you ask, you ask, a, you 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 see something, ask why is that? Why is it that way? And say, hey, what can we do to fix it? That's any basic research. Uh, question you're back sorry um just like your your air conditioning when you were here the wi-fi hasn't gotten much better so <laughs> no, no, no no everybody's on, on using it so i'm sure it's uh probably everyone's fighting for the for, for the for the um, for the data so the last thing I heard was that you, you, you've conducted a handful of clinical trials. Now, I'm sorry if you're repeating yourself here, but um, what kind of, do you just do like specific medications or is it a procedure that you're looking into? So um, right, the last trial we did, we looked at a specific medication to see if we use it to prevent bleeding. But um, we've also, we're also looking at uh, different postpartum management protocols we can implement to and see how that affects our um, patients. So there's, there's almost anything you can think of if it's gonna, we, there's a lot of questions, sorry, let me rephrase that, are unanswered when it comes to pregnant moms because they're a population most people don't wanna study because you have the liability of studying not only a woman, but there's just a baby in there too. So we're, we're trying to answer some questions that are just not, haven't been asked. Right, and is that something that attracted you into OB anesthesia was, the fact that there's really two patients uh, for every one. Uh, I guess also like what made you choose OB anesthesia as your specialty? Okay, so let me let me give you two different scenarios, right? You take care of a, um, a cardiac patient, right? They're trying to die and return to the road. You've been in that room for eight hours, right? You take them to recovery room, to, sorry, to the ICU post-operatively, tube in place. You go back the next day and say, Mr. Smith, um, I took care of you yesterday. Mr. Smith, how are you doing? Who are you? Mm. Okay, okay. scenario two. Walk into a patient's room. She is screaming, ready, ready to kill her husband <laughs> because she's hurting so bad from her contractions, right? You say, hey, Ms. Smith, um, I'm Dr. Oko from Anesthesia. You, you never seen somebody so happy to see you, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you place her epidural and she can't think, she thinks you are just God's gift to mankind because her pain went from 10 out of 10 to nothing. Which one would you like, which one would you rather do? That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Now, uh, shifting gears, you, you told us at the end of the presentation, balance is important and I couldn't agree more. Right now, um, a lot of us are, are gearing up for the MCAT, so we don't really have a lot of that. Um, but I, I was wondering what kind of things do you do to bring balance into your life when you're not in the hospital? What, what kind of things do you do in your free time uh, to just kind of unwind? You guys, I've already showed I like to travel. Right. Uh, I, like, I like to read. I, like to read. I, I still read a lot of books even now. Probably read like four to six books at, at a time. Probably finish four of them a month. So I'm, I'm a big reader. And that doesn't even count audiobooks. That, once I find audiobooks, that's just like just reading regular books. But I also listen to audiobooks. I'm, I'm a big uh, audio didact. So I like I just like learning in general. Listen to podcasts too, same thing. Um, I like playing sports. I grew up playing a lot of sports. So my kids, we go play soccer. They've taken up tennis recently, so we're playing tennis. So just, I think uh, hanging out with family is probably what I do the most for balance. And then when the pandemic comes to an end, hopefully we can get back to traveling, which is what I find to be most interesting. Seeing right. somewhere, seeing somewhere new, seeing other people's culture, just seeing people living their regular day-to-day -day life in completely different surrounding. Right, and it seems like you guys have, have already visited an amazing amount of places, so been to a lot of cool spots. Um, can you talk to us also about your work-life balance as an undergrad, as a med student, as a resident? Because obviously now as an attending, you kind of have a little bit more free time than before. 
um, what, what is that like? Or, or no, you're still busy all the time. <laughs> remember, remember my picture, right? And from my undergrad picture, it was just, it was me and a girlfriend, right? Fair enough. <laughs> right? and I, nice and easy life was grand. I don't know why I did with all my time. Did it, Cause I had, I don't know what I did with all my time, right? Cause basically you have what, three to four classes a day. Maybe they're an hour, maybe they're 90 minute classes, right? Then you have all these hours, just, I don't know what, what I did with them, they just figured away. Okay, med school, all right, more classes, but now you have to study more. So your time is going away. Residency, now you're working 60 to get your ICU 80 hour weeks and you still have to study, right? It's not just, so mm -hmm. all your quote unquote free time is you have, you're working and then you have to go home and study before you go to sleep or you have to, for example, you're taking care of a kick patient. Next, you have to read up on all those patients, prepare your plan, right? And you still have to study. So remember all that free time you had at undergrad and med school? Now, med school felt like I had so much free time I was wasting there too. Residency is a different beast, right? You become an attending, you think, ta da, I've reached the promised land. I don't have it. I'm right through. Well, you forgot that you now have a wife and you have some kids, right? Who also need your attention and need your help, right? But you also still have to work on your research manuscripts, right? You still have to take your admin responsibilities for work, right? You still want to work out. You still want to read a book. Yeah, or four. <laughs> exactly. So, so your time. I guess time, it just changes. It changes. You know? and it, and Reallocated. It, yep. It, yep. It, it, it changes. It's funny. At, at every stage, like I said, you think to yourself, Oh, I don't have any time doing anything. Oh, I don't have any time doing anything. You get to the next, you're like, what was I doing back there? Because just think about your high school self. You're like, what was I, oh, what, yeah. what was, what was I doing? What was I doing? <laughs> <laughs> so time, time, but time is what you make it, right? Anything that you find, anything that you deem important, you will find enough time for. That's, that's a good way of thinking of it. Now, we have a question from someone in the audience. Jaden Baker asks if you saw any struggles overcoming the racial barriers to the medical field whether that means reaching it or once you've got it, any sort of bias or stereotypes, anything like that? That's a great question. So just because you're a physician, right, doesn't mean you, your color of your skin changes, right? You are still, you're still who you are. And people are going to treat you a certain way just based on their biases and their, and their, uh, and their prejudices. We've, we've all faced it, myself included. But at the end of the day, I'm not there for them. I'm there to take, to provide the best care that I can. So how you feel about me has no, it hurts obviously, but it's not gonna impact how I'm gonna treat you. So we, and don't worry, you're gonna face it, no matter, you're gonna face it, no matter the color of your skin, you're gonna face it based on your gender, you're gonna face it based on your sexuality, you're gonna face it based on your height. You're gonna face, like, no matter you be the perfect human being, someone's gonna find something wrong, right? So it's, you can either react, it hurts, don't, don't, don't let me minimize and say, oh no, it's just, oh, it's, you know, just let it brush off your back. No, no, it hurts. But you have to realize you, 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 get, you get to choose how you react. And if somebody's gonna give you hate, if you hit them with love, what can they say? So that's, my that's a great way. And I like how you said that, um, you know, at the end of the day, they're still your patients and you have to treat everyone with the same respect and dignity that that they deserve because that's your job as a physician. So I think that's a great, great answer to that. Um, Haley or Grace, do you guys have any, any questions here? All right, I just didn't want to cut, cut you guys off or anything here. Um, so I I'd like to know, are you in the OR five days a week as, or are you also doing uh, epidurals? Like what does your weekly schedule look like? So when I first started, I was in the OR five days a week. Right, every six or seven days a week at right. some point. Okay, but now I'm in the ORs, maybe half, half of my time. I have to spend part of my time doing research, I spend part of my time doing administrative stuff. So it changes, right? As you gain seniority or you're asked to take on uh, different roles, your how much clinical work you do can go up and down. At some point, I can say, oh, I don't want to do any more ad, I want to go back to doing more ORs, right? You kind of, one thing about academic medicine is you can, you can create a lane for yourself. There's some people who did all the training I did and said, you know what? The impact I want to make is just doing research. They spend one day in the OR week, spend every other day doing research, mm -hmm. right? So it gives you that, academic medicine gives you the ability to um, 
kind of create a way for yourself. If I was if I was in private practice, I'd be nowhere every single day I was at work because that's what that's what that experience is about. Right. So and now I'd like to know a little bit about your administrative duties. Uh, what does that um, what does that look like from your position or what what's role do you have? So I am the um, I have one administrative duty at university level, which is more um, trying to promote our research and quality improvement initiatives um, at an institutional level, and then also um, coordinating our two major hospitals, um, trying to synchronize the care we provide for patients. So that's one. But then also at the hospital I primarily, my primary works, which is Parkland Hospital, I also have, huh, I have more meetings than I, I have a lot of meetings, so I put, put, that, put it that way, from things as from mother resuscitating moms to how well our neonates neonatal outcomes are. So the, mm -hmm. it, it varies to just mundane things like making sure that all of our um, all of our days of work are adequately staffed by the right number of uh, physicians. So all right. it, it, it's all over the place. So it seems like your work schedule is, is very varied between that and research, um, your kids, <laughs> everything. Yeah. Um, we have another audience question here for you. Uh, pertaining to the high morbid morbidity and mortality rate of black women during childbirth. She asks, what role do you see an OB anesthesiologist and other physicians playing in addressing this disparity? I see us all, I see us playing a major role in addressing this, this disparity. Um, it hasn't, and it's not even like, we can't blame on social economics. And even when they stay, when they um, stabilize for that, the disparities are still high. So I think all physicians who take care of pregnant mothers have a role not just to decrease their pain, but also for as an anesthesiologist, decrease their pain, but also to keep them safe. So I think my, my role, what I, the number one cause of uh, mortality worldwide is still bleeding, right? And most of that bleeding occurs in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, minority populations, all right? So my research is hoping to help stem some of that problem. So I think I think we all have a role to play, but I'm taking a, my 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 research on hemorrhage is specifically for that problem. I was born in Nigeria. Nigeria has one of the highest um, number of women, not the highest mortality rate, but the highest number of women, just based on the size of the population, uh, who who die from pregnancy. So I think I have a, a duty to help uh, fight some of that. Sounds like you're taking a very active role in this issue. I'm trying. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit more on, on kind of the history behind, you said once you check or, or kind of standardize for the uh, socioeconomic disparities, we still see these same sort of effects. Uh, does, does any of your work focus on this? Any of your research work or maybe experience? Can you elaborate on this? The, the, so my, um, my primary hospital site is a bit skewed. We have a much higher Hispanic population than probably most hospitals in the country. Mm. So our, I guess we were probably not a good site as far as, I mean, obviously it's a, at any site we can still work on these issues, but like we, if we're looking for black women make about just a small proportion of the population of my patients in my hospital, because Dallas County mm. has a huge Hispanic population that lives in our hospital. Right. So, but either way, even if you, back to your original question, when look at someone like Serena Williams, who's one of the richest people in the world, probably one of the best athletes of all time, mm -hmm. right? She almost died during childbirth, right? And she felt, and she said one of her primary complaints was, hey, I kept telling them I'm having pain in my lungs and no one believed me. And she found out she had a clot or she pain in her lungs and no one believed her she had a clot. So it can happen to, even if you're Serena Williams, right? Who has right. Money, money to spare it's, you, you can still be impacted by, by, by uh, I mean, that tumble. I mean, you, you really can't get more famous or important than Serena Williams, you know, um, that's, that's unbelievable. It sounds like you're really doing your home country proud through your, through your research. Have you found, have you done, have you found anything in terms of maybe providing a solution or pulling the curtain back on the root cause of these hemorrhage, these disproportionate hemorrhages in the um, impoverished populations. So the the, um, the sad part about hemorrhage factors your high risk for bleeding, but the issue is that most hemorrhages occur in women who have no risk factors. Mm -hmm. 
So then it's, even if my attempt to prevent, it won't be running in a small population, most bleeding occurs open population risk factors. So that's a bigger question that we're all trying to, I guess, get our hands around as not only anesthesiologists, but obstetricians and other uh, services. Gotcha. All right. Well, I th unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for your presentation today. But Dr. Gunkwa, that was amazing. Um, fantastic story straight from the beginning at you as a seventh grader um, all the way up to now. I think it's been an amazing story. So very inspiring. We thank you so much for coming on. Um, everyone else who's following along, I'm dropping the chat to the quiz, or sorry, they're dropping the link to the quiz in the chat right now. Um, thanks again for coming. Follow along in the email list and look on our website for future um, presentations. And in the meantime, everyone have a great weekend. Thanks. All right, for go, go Terps.